to get a seat wherever you can. Well, I want to thank you all for coming, and I want to thank the panelists for offering their time to be here. This is an event that we coordinated between our user group and uh, John. Uh, John is very big on how to help the community grow by developing user groups. And uh, so we wanted to, the Northwest C++ Users Group to get involved in this conference. And one of the ways is to have panel discussions as well as our normal monthly uh, meetings where we get together and talk about various aspects of C++. So uh, I just wanted each of the panelists to give their introduction. My name is Brett Searles. I'm the Vice President of the Northwest C++ Users Group. And I work in various uh, technologies, um, but mostly in mixed, managed, and C++ code. So um, that's my background. Uh, I'm Jim Merkruth. I work at Google on client and LVM and C++ and lots of optimization -y things. Hi, I'm Matt Gobel. Um, when I'm not running a website that bears my own name, I'm a developer <laughs> at a DLW, a trading company in Chicago. Hi, I'm Jim Radigan. I work at Microsoft. The mic. Mike's not on. Oh, he's saying Mike's right. Close your mouth. Close your mouth. Hello? Yeah. Okay. Hi. I'm Jim Radigan. I work at Microsoft. And I am the architect for the Google C compiler. Close your mouth. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> I'm Jim. Hi, Jim. <laughs> so if you do have a question, we'd like you to come up to the mics. Uh, this forum is not going to be, we're going to sit here and present or talk about something. We want you to ask questions. So we, if you have questions, please come on up. Maybe we'll give you some heads uh, or topics to start with, but that's basically the forum is for you to ask questions about how to improve your code performance through compilers, switching, and things like that. So. In the one. Oh, yes. um, how do you feel about build time? I, I am until recently a C programmer. I'm used to 100 millisecond compile per C file. And I'm having a very, very hard time getting used to a 30 second compile for an empty file. <laughs> Wait, what compiler are you using, buddy? <laughs> Clang. There's a pre-HH. So, so, so your file's not empty. Uh, I wish it was. Yes. Uh, I'm just, I'm just saying. <laughs> Have you tried compiling an empty file? <laughs> an empty file is faster, I admit. And a file without boost and without, you know, 10 megabytes of legacy code that you have to include to make anything work in the C++ project. Did you compile your compiler with the release flag on for the compiler itself? <laughs> I, I don't know if everyone else realized they were coming to the comedy show. <laughs> Sorry about that, folks. You got the wrong idea here. Like, should we actually maybe give a serious answer? Well, we, we, I, I, I can only talk about the Microsoft compiler. So I can talk to Mike. So we do, uh, we do a lot of uh, engineering for throughput because basically we. The way the development goes in our team is we build live compilers against live Windows sources every day. And so basically if the stress test from the images that look, there we go. So when we uh, when we build the images, right, we're, we're building them on like 56 core machines and there are five different flavors. And so compile time actually is a big deal. So the back end is multi-threaded and we do a lot of clever things to uh, partition the way we, we build things, for, especially for the debug information. So obviously, it's, it's a big concern for when we build a platform. But I don't know uh, how that helps you. <laughs> I'm just well, talking. I don't know. I mean, the, it's important to, you can obviously uh, build with just simple optimization on. You can turn off the debug symbols if you don't need them. If you just want to run something quickly, put 01 on and 
don't put any debug symbols in, just run your test, see if it works, and if you need to actually do a build and, and um, uh, you know, debug it in some way, then you might have to have multiple different types of build. You know, release with debug symbols, release with no debug symbols, those kinds of things. Also, uh, there's this weird thing called modules. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah. Well, what can we think about that? <laughs> or frequent file headers. Or, or frequent file headers, that works too. But I think he has that, it's actually causing problems. So. Yeah, yeah uh, we've been trying to turn it off, because the pre-compiled header alone is a good half a GB. So. That's, what the, that's, an, that's a really common problem for uh, build times, is when uh, pre-compiled headers are what we call bloated. So, they're, they're, you know, oftentimes there's a, a lot of extra stuff in there, and so if you actually make a change and you have to create the pre-compiled header, you're, you're a sinking ship for compile time. So you might want to look at how to factor all that code. Well, we know, it's just, um, coming from C, it feels, very, it feels to me very much as an intrinsic problem in C++, it really encourages you to include more and more and more things instead of having them hide in implementation files. All right, all right. Yeah. Uh, well, I won't keep that in mind. Yeah, we just got to just use the one. <laughs> Here we can actually uh, uh, dig in some. So, so I think that people worrying about like how C++ encourages you to include more, that's not that's not the right thing to be thinking about. Um, and, and I would encourage you to kind of go, go uh, how many folks here know who Elon Musk is? Just checking, you know. Um, do folks like actually like follow him? And, have you like read any of what he's written and stuff? Right. He has a great he has a great uh, uh, thing that he talks about called first principle thinking. And I actually really encourage people to follow that kind of approach to anything to do with uh, programming as well. So let's think about what you're actually doing. You're including too many header files. You say, like, how many? Like, what do folks think is too many header files? Uh, like, is is a million lines of pre-processed source code too many? Too much header files? Anyone think that's true? Anyone? How about how about ten million? Is that too much? How about how about like twenty million? All right. So 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 let's think about something. How long do you think it takes you to run the grep tool over twenty million lines of text? Um, about fifty milliseconds. About fifty milliseconds. So why is C plus plus compiling so slow? This is the thing, it's not about how much you include, it's about what we do with the things that we include. And that's why modules is interesting. It's not because it reduces simply the number of interfaces that you're pulling in, right? It's not, it's not just about text processing. It's that we have to do a tremendous amount of work to actually parse a header file into C++ code, right, into some internal representation. With something like modules, you don't have to do that parsing, you don't have to do that expensive step. And so then like, the amount of things you include, or hopefully you know, import, stops being relevant for, for build times, right? Do you know why pre-compiled headers has not made the main uh, transition to towards that already? Because yeah. it's like, we, we've tried pre-compiled headers, they did not speed up at all. Well, one of the things, the biggest thing with pre-compiled headers is how you've actually factored your build system. So that if you want to make an incremental change, you really, set up to recompile the minimum amount of stuff. So if you just blindly create one big giant pre-compiled header, which is what normally happens when we deal with customers, you're going to take a hit. So the biggest thing for compile time on a, on a system is how you're configured and how you factor the code. I, I am aware of the incremental build problems and I am aware about how pre-compiled headers consolidate changes so that if you do change one thing, then suddenly you have to recompile everything. I'm still talking about that empty file, pre-compiled header, turn that 30 second into 20 second. You need a better pre-compiled header. Like, I think we're rattling a little bit here because there's something weird with your system. Like, I, I, and, and, and I, I'm sad to give you like an answer of like, I don't know, something's weird. Like, that, that is kind of a lame answer, but, but I don't know of anyone who has 30 seconds to like open a pre-compiled header and not do anything. I don't know of any compiler anywhere that does that. Unless you have, unless your pre-compiled header is on NFS. Oh, it is. <laughs> wait, 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 wait. So, 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 step one: copy your pre-compiled header to NFS. I've tried that. Um, anyway, we don't we don't need to do a live debug. Anyway, yeah, whatever. Let's, let's get some other questions. Go. Thank you. Isn't there an option for client to dump out timing information as well? Can you use like F timing something something? That option is terrible. Okay. <laughs> just, to, just to see the audience, 
the, the, I thought what we were up here to do is talk about uh, size versus speed and uh, some of the things that we're working on, so probably like build times and security too, so that's a great way to see the audience, I think. Is that okay? Where's Anyways. All right, so I'll do a little bit of a follow-up. Uh, and, and cast it as a tooling issue, though. Uh, so I do use pre-compiled headers, and they actually are great. They, they help a lot. But I think there is a lot of room for the tools to give us more information about how to set up our pre-compiled headers effectively. Yes, totally agree. We're, and we're bad because we didn't do that. So, any thoughts from you on that? I, I get, you could actually use the linker to actually do that for you, and that's something we're actually, we're right now we're worried about doing this for the Xbox developers, because they've got these giant monolithic binaries and giant <coughs> monolithic pre-compiled headers, and they want to have distributed builds. And as everybody moves more and more to distributed builds, the refactoring and modules is going to be a big deal. All right, can I say something unfashionable here, and by the trend? I'm not a fan of pre-compiled headers. I'm looking forward to modules. I think they can help us here. But I, whenever I've tried to use pre-compiled headers, and again, it may be a tooling issue, but I've always fallen on the foul of the everything.h, and now I curse myself every time I make a trivial change to, to having a fast on an individual file basis, but slow because every file in my entire project had to rebuild. And so I think that following the sort of Lacosian ideas of trying to bring break down your code a little bit more sensibly, pulling out implementations from headers into CPP files where it's possible and where it's sensible to do so. And then in order to regain some of the, the performance that you may otherwise lose because of the inlining abilities, using link time optimization as a, like, a final step for, for full performance, this has been something that has, has seemed to work for us. Yeah, that makes sense. Again, it all, <laughs> it all comes back to refactoring your, you know, knowing those that you need to uh, pull out and refactor for incremental builds. Then that might even shift as, as your development cycle goes through all the different milestones. Hi, um, I work on some uh, scientific and technical computing applications that often require large amount of data, large to normal people extent, not to Google extent, like say in the tens of gigabytes of data. Uh, what I have found that works sometimes is I memory map the file and then I can read it from all the threads. I normally don't need to write to the data, I just need to read it. Some other times, however, it's better to just allocate a buffer and copy the entire thing and dump it there. And I still find no general rule or no general guidance on how to do that except for profiling individual applications. Do you have any advice or what is your go-to guideline for dealing with this kind of problem? Again, about tens of gigabytes read from multiple threads to which you don't write. What? Else? I mean, I, I, I get that this is a performance related thing, but I don't know how related it is to build options and things like that. But I mean, I can certainly give, we, whenever we had to do this, we use memory mapping and we just tell the kernel um, on Linux that, hey, we're going to be reading this sequentially or something like that. And that seems to do what we need from, from that. But I don't have much more to offer than that. But. I was just going to ask you, uh, wh when did you find that the buffer was faster than the memory map file? Um, I, I couldn't quote the specific instance, but it was uh, they, they all tend to be the same uh, touch on many different regions of memory from the different threads. So one is touching at the bottom of the file, one another thread is, stopping, is touching at the top of the file. And again, they, the files tend to be about the same size. I don't know if it was a platform issue or if, if I could pass some compiler flags to make the compiler understand that I would be reading in that way. No, that's, that's definitely a system issue, right? And okay. What you talked about <coughs> basically a locality issue, mm -hmm. right? So it depends on what else is on the system and what part of the program you're in. Okay. I think. Ask this question at a Linux panel. <laughs> 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 they don't like C++ and they do. <laughs> I'm literally not a secret, I'm literally not a secret. C++ and C use the same IO subsystem. I agree. <laughs> They're Linux. All right, thank you guys. I have a um, compiler flag feature request. Um, <laughs> in the in the JetBrains IDE, I believe it is, I saw this feature where you could set it to where it would just, when you're stepping debugging, it would just keep stepping until it got back out of namespace standard. So if you're stepping through like a, 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 a standard function, 
They you know, don't have to step through all like the virtual column like crap to get to your actual code. And I would like to A, be able to do this in a configure amount of namespace, that's other tooling, but I would also like it to inlang all the template bloat in those namespaces so that my debug builds run faster because it optimizes the part that I'm not debugging because it's not my code, it's library code. Is that possible? Why is that a bad idea? Shoot me down. <laughs> you want to like you you want to be able to jump out of a namespace basically, right? Yeah, well, I mean, I want to say, okay, boost and STD, anything, uh, um, you know, all of those like ten function steps that somebody had to module, uh, write as functions to make TMP work. I don't want to step through those. I want those all to be in. I mean, I, 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 it can't be a full release build because things like debug iterators would still have to be debug iterators and whatever. But so the Visual Studio debugger, and I, I know that it's maybe a bad thing to say here, but the, you could do that by actually set, setting, you know, breakpoints and letting it fly to the appropriate spot. To yeah, yeah, no, that's what I do now. But I, 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 I um, for example, in like game design or, or on, on, on small systems, uh, the size of debug builds and the speed of debug uh, uh, builds is a problem. Like, or, or, or I don't know, dereferencing a smart pointer, especially a unique pointer. Why does that have to be a function call? Okay, okay, so, so you're actually asking two different questions here. Yeah, okay. So, so the first question is why do I have to single step over this stuff? And the answer is you don't. Debuggers have like cool, fancy tools. You can use breakpoints and Microsoft yeah, okay, right. yeah. In, in GDB, I don't know if people know about the finish command of GDB. It's awesome. It's totally great. Check it out. Um, but that takes care of the single stepping stuff. It's still slow. Um, to get to get debug builds to not be slow, uh, it, it, there's, there's, there's a totally magical secret. It's amazing. You'll never have thought about it. You have to turn on the optimizer. Yes. Uh, that now, now, this isn't, of course, trivial because now you have to debug despite having turned on the optimizer. But I don't think that there's there's a really great magical uh, way to do this. So, so uh, I'll tell you what I know people do today when they when they have to solve this problem and what I would like them to do in the future. Uh, today, there are a couple of techniques to try and get code you're not debugging to be optimized and the code you're debugging to not be optimized. Um, the two big techniques I know about are, are on one hand using kind of per file based control. So there are a bunch of pragmas you can use to like try and hackily turn optimizations on and off. And I know a bunch of game studios actually have whole systems set up to, to like control this on a per header file and on a per source file basis. So they can control exactly what gets optimized and not. And wherever they're debugging, they turn the optimizations off there and just there, everything else remains optimized. Um, uh, there's also in Clang, there's an attribute called optnone which has a similar effect of trying to turn off optimizations in a few places so you can try and debug things in those places while leaving everything else optimized. You can kind of tell none of these are great options, but that's what we've got today, right? Um, or, or like just turning it off on, on like a per file on a translation unit basis. So when you compile one file, you turn it off, turn off optimizations, but the rest of them you turn them on. In the future, I just think that you should be able to have at least uh, some of your optimizations on all the time, even when you're debugging. And Microsoft's compilers actually does a pretty good job of this today. It's, it's one of the things that, that I'm a little jealous about with my compiler. It doesn't do as good a job of that. Um, but I think, I mean, I don't want to speak for Microsoft, but I think a lot of the different compilers, I know GCC is doing this in Clang, uh, we we're hoping to do this eventually, are, are essentially working on letting you turn on many optimizations, if not, not all of them, and still at least have a plausible debug experience. And, and the more we have these kind of zero cost abstractions in C++ that rely on optimizations, the more important this is going to become. I mean, I think this is going to be essential if you, if you, if you look at the limited time. Um, uh, we have to solve this problem, right? Uh, OG is what it's called in, in GCC. Uh, it, it's not going to work great. You're going to find that, that OG actually optimizes more than you really wanted it to. Um, it's like, oh my gosh. <laughs> Um, and, and in Clang and LLVM, we're kind of hoping to turn O1 into this mode, but, but GCC, I have to say, is like what, way out in front of us here. We've got a lot of work to do. So it's, gonna be, it's not going to be anytime soon. But there's an actual like build compiler flag and like performance Yeah, yeah I use answer for now, it. and sometimes I use like O3 and then do not optimize in the spot that I want. But it's, it's a lot of fiddling with it rather than just a compiler flag like I want this namespace. Uh, I mean, what you are debugging right? maps well to namespace <laughs> rather than huh? You are debugging, right? Like, did you expect this to not be a little fiddly? I mean, <laughs> well, if it's a hard real-time system, then yeah. you know, 
and, and, and you have like a performance difference of 5x or 10x or something, then, you know, yeah, like either you don't debug at all or you debug with an oscilloscope or something, or you start fiddling like this. Yeah, and I mean, there are some other things like we were, I was at John Bridger's uh, talk earlier today, like you know, in order to solve a lot of the horrific things that you have to do, particularly in the embedded world, in order to get around the type punny, you're going to have to start using memcopy a lot more to copy between type puns types, which is cool when the optimizer's on because it will go away, but it will just make your debug bio builds even slower on the time critical bits that you're doing this in the first place for. So I think there's a need for it. I agree with what everybody was saying. You've got the pra pragma optimize on, pragma optimize off, and then sometimes for debug builds, what we see a lot is that uh, you want to force inline certain things for the debug build. And that might even be enough to actually get it to be fast enough for you. Well, yeah, you want to do that with a macro so you can turn it back off and release builds so it right. doesn't confuse the optimizer. Right. Yeah. But oftentimes, the first thing that chokes on the debug builds is that you're you're not inlining some sort of key things that are used. Yeah, but sometimes you still like even though you inlined it, there'll still be like canary objects and stuff that are there. You know, ten times. We don't have to like we don't have to like 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 live debate this for yeah, a while. Exactly. Uh, I'm just saying like I think I think we've given you the best answer we've got. All right. Thanks. Uh, so the, the question will touch on the compiler that is unfortunately not represented here, but the third one. But uh, so we have a code base and several million lines of code. We were compiling with GCC four, and we have two like regular builds. That just overnight we build the whole thing. One is optimized build. One is everything built with debug build. And then in, like in the morning you come in, you write your code, you, you, know, you compile, compile your own stuff. Everything is debug already. You debug very nice. Uh, we switch to GCC six. The object size went up by over 10x, like about 30x. I can't link the damn thing on a 64 gig machine anymore. <laughs> if I build the whole thing with debug, do you know of any? So we have basically we cannot build the whole code base with debug, which means we have to go back to fiddling. You know, do you know of a solution? I don't have a solution. I'm just wondering if you're using lots of concepts for. No, we're actually it's actually C plus plus or three. So so. I still play a little bit with GCC. Uh, what is this? Is this optimize and debug? No, just debug. So one, one you know, we, we we used to have to optimize, no debug, and uh, dash g yeah. dash g o zero. So these were the two, and dash g was like you know, several times bigger, uh, but it was usable. Now what? dash g is like thirty times bigger. What 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 version of GCC four? Four four two versus six. So three, I think. I, I'm not trying to that's, that's like a decade and a half of compilers, man. <laughs> <laughs> like, I don't know how much, like, like. But I mean, six is the one that blew up. But like, did you did you try the intervening versions? Like, I hate to say this is just bisecting over compiler versions. <laughs> I understand that, that that may be a little frustrating, uh, but really. Yeah. Well, we did try five, four, two, I believe, and it had similar problem. So it's it's between four and five. I mean, like, the thing that's coming to my mind is between 4.9 4 and 5, we, you got a, you got a very different uh, standard library. There's a lot of standard library work that landed there. And, and standard library can, can really change things when you're doing debug builds because it doesn't get inlined, right? Like, it's, it can be quite bad. Uh, yeah, as, as, as we just talked about. Um, but, like, I, I don't know what you can do. I would, I would uh, suggest that you actually will just have to debug this, but there's some great tools you can use. I'll save this answer. There's some great tools you can use to debug this kind of stuff. So, um, how many folks here know about uh, Bodie McBoatface? <laughs> so, how many folks here know about the tool called Bloaty McBloatface? <laughs> Go check it out. It's 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 on GitHub. It's called Bloaty, um, and it's a great little old tool. It actually you point it at like object files or an executable, and it'll actually kind of break down where all of the the size is going, and it'll even let you do kind of a before and after comparison, so you can try and get an idea of like what part of your object file is getting bigger. Um, and once you know what part of the object file is getting bigger, you might have some idea. For example, if you see that it's a very particular kind of debug info, so so there are a bunch of different versions. So, so on Linux, your debug info is called dwarf. And there are a bunch of different versions of Dwarf. And in particular, the version of Dwarf used by GCC 4.4 is totally different from the one used by GCC 6. And so, so one thing that you may be hitting is that the new version of Dwarf just has a dramatically less efficient encoding for some really common pattern in your code base. 
right? So, so, so uh, Velody may help you with that. If, if that's what it is, there's a flag. You can actually change what version of Dwarf you're using. Um, so when you do dash G, you can actually give it more parameters. So you can do dash G and then Dwarf 2 or Dwarf 3 or Dwarf 4. Um, dwarf 4 is what I think GCC6 is using. Dwarf 2 is almost certainly what 4.4 was using. That's a long time ago. Um, and so just, you can just try and roll it back to Dwarf 2. And that may help alone. And, and if not, like knowing what sections it is, you can maybe follow up with the GCC folks so that they can they can dig it a little bit deeper. That's 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 the best idea I have. I'm sorry. Oh, oh, there's compressed debug sections as well, uh, but I would not expect that to change between 4.4 and 6. Well, but like, yeah, yeah, yeah. But like his his old debug info was fine, right? Like you shouldn't need to compress it to get back to that. And, uh, and yeah, it actually makes your link slower because when you compress the debug sections, you can't just mmap them to link them. Anyways. Hey, uh, maybe my question is really dumb, but the world is changing, so maybe I'm missing something. So the compiler is the software, right? And like the other software, it might have... Compilers are like magic and unicorn stuff. Yeah, it, about. It's, it's, a, it's a very complicated software, I understand. And, uh, like any software, it has bugs, right? So, uh, <laughs> no, <here's>, my, <laughs> no bugs here. We're good. Yeah. Thanks, though. <laughs> <laughs> and recently, we got lots of new great features into the language and the libraries. So, uh, did you notice that the number of bugs increased? Bugs, yeah. In the compiler, in the library. As a user of compilers, as someone who stares at assembly a lot, yeah, I mean, for example, bugs. With them, I've not seen an increase in the number of bugs myself, but you know, I, I've seen about the same amount I would expect in any other revision, and then very rarely are they critical bugs. They're always performance-related bugs, and weird yeah. cases and things like that. And so I'm not I personally happy, but I, again, I'm a user, and I would pass on to somebody who maybe makes them. makes bugs. <laughs> makes bugs. Yes. <laughs> I'm not sure exactly what I'd be answering here. You, are you asking me how we create, how, why are compilers buggy? <laughs> no, not why, I understand why. Because they become more buggy. One of the things I can say for sure is uh, in, the, in the Microsoft compiler is that um, as we get more aggressive on performance and we're also changing the front ends to be more and more language compliant, <laughs> And uh, that creates like a, a real ripple effect, and it's really subtle. So you know, that's probably uh, the biggest source is that it's constantly a moving target for us. So and we're also adding features in there to set code size, and we're adding features in there to, to uh, stuff for security. And then at the same time, we're adding new language features like yield and wait, and we're doing uh, we're doing catch up on the conformance work too. So we're seeing all sorts of new constructs for the first time and sequences of abstractions going through. But that's that's a normal business and we try to actually you know compile as much real world code as we can. I think right now we are compiling fifty three open source projects on a daily basis in addition to Windows. But that's still you know we're still gonna have bugs. Yeah correct. <laughs> but just as it goes past I'm gonna steal it again. Um, the other thing I've noticed that compilers are doing as they get more sophisticated is they take more and more advantage of the kind of things that you are never allowed to do and yet you do anyway. So the type hunting stuff that I mentioned earlier, So and sometimes this can be misinterpreted as compiler works. I know there's a lot of people who are scared to turn on O3 because the compiler breaks their code and in fact their code is broken and they should fix their code. So I, I'd just like to put in that and let that, you know, <laughs> there's a few people raising their fists up there. but. Uh, the Microsoft doesn't go up to three. Yeah. <laughs> Five is right out. <laughs> so, so the other thing I'll say is, is uh, well, well, so I think I think you can you can make an argument that compilers clearly are, are getting bug, more buggy over time. And the reason I think you can make that argument is that compilers consist of more code over time, and and sadly that means more bugs. Uh, on the flip side, though, uh, we are getting better and better as as uh, as an industry at, at doing software engineering, essentially driving bugs out of our code. Uh, we have tools like sanitizers. We have you know better testing methodologies. Uh, I've never seen compilers 
that are better tested than the compilers are today, right? The, the, I don't mean I don't mean in terms of like per feature, like I, I mean holistically, like like we're actually testing more of the compiler, we're also testing it better, and right? we're doing a better job of testing it. And so, so the real question is, are we are we improving our software engineering discipline on the compiler faster than we're adding code to the compiler? That's actually kind of that's the question of whether the compiler is getting more or less buggy. Um, and I think that that's like really hard to tell. But I'm I'm hopeful I'm hopeful that we're we're getting better at software faster. That's an interesting view. I'd actually like to talk to Chandler about this for a second. So we have a philosophy. Well, hold on, I still got the mic, buddy. <laughs> 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 this is a really interesting problem, so I'm going to selfishly uh, steal the mic. <laughs> so the, the, the philosophy that we've taken uh, to be pragmatic about this is to compile as many real-world uh, code bases and run their, their uh, testing as a, an exhaustive means to make sure that we're doing things on a daily basis against a lot of compilers, because there's a tremendous enough, uh, there's a lot of stuff about their improving, Putting clever research throughout the code base, you can, you can go do static analysis over and over. But it, the only thing that I found, and I finally gave into it, like about I don't know, maybe seven years ago, was we, we just wound up trying to compile everything that we possibly could against live compilers and get it within a 24-hour period. So that was. I wonder what your thoughts were on software engineering. That's what you were. Oh my goodness. Uh, uh, we got like like a queue of people. Let's come back to this if we if we drag out the audience. Huh? All right. <laughs> I do kind of want to do that, but I think I think this gonna like kill the whole panel. We should, we yeah, should so talk more about like performance and space things first. Yeah. So the question is, uh, do you still do you recommend to use once the compiler was released? Do you recommend to use it in production right away? Yeah. So so here's what I will say. Uh, uh, Google or, currently is uh, shipping. <coughs> Top of tree, Elvin and Clang, um, to all our developers to build production binaries uh, with a latency of substantially less than two weeks. So, so everyone, every developer at Google is building their production binaries with an LLVM that is under two weeks from being committed to the repository. Yeah, and as a representative of uh, the finance industry, where we you know we test, we have rigorous tests. We get the latest compiler pretty much straight away, run all the code before the test pass. We're good to go. Well, the problem is it's sometimes not just enough to compile and run some tests. You have a testing. Problem. If you have <laughs> if you have data driven tests, uh, and you can run into the case of there is a bug related to optimization which doesn't work as, as you expected. And you, you need more tests. <laughs> well, there you are can tests. test for optimizations as well. There are tests. Uh, the reason why I'm asking because I ran into this case recently with the mag migrating from the Visual Studio 2015 to 17. So I, I, mean, I noticed a really nasty issue. The code was really old. It was written a while ago. But okay, but what's the question? So the question was, like, is it a good idea to use compiler right now? I don't think we can give you a more definitive answer of yes. <laughs> okay, good, thank you. Well, you know, there's a, a website you can actually file those bugs for right away. Uh, sorry, my question isn't about size and speed. Uh, we all know there is this flag minus E capital uh, which runs the preprocessor and uh, I really hate to read the output of this uh, comment but it's useful. Sometimes I have no other choice. Can we have something similar for templates? I understand it won't be pretty. I understand it won't be really hard to read but it may be useful in some cases. I mean, I can talk about this. Yeah, I'd like that feature too. I mean, I think in my ID, I can already expand out um, any pound-defined thing and see what it actually expands to. It would be lovely to see the templates. And I think some of the things that Herb was saying in the keynote about um, the new Metaclass stuff and the exposition of those kinds of things, I think you know the tooling needs to improve. Um, I'm not qualified to improve the tooling, but these gentlemen are. So who wants to? No, all right. He's not qualified. He's not qualified for it. But um, I mean, we have, we've had, there are tool vendors as well. I mean, just speak to tool vendors because, like, LibClang gives you a lot of facilities to be able to walk through the code and potentially do some. 
Find, find you told. Check out the temp light. insert run to, uh, range checks for certain constructs. We'll do things for, uh, to prevent use after free, but a lot of people are afraid to turn that stuff on because they're worried about the performance. And then the other thing that we're doing in the compiler, which uh, is uh, internal to Microsoft and may wind up coming out on the street, is uh, we have to go back, and I'm sure everybody has read the papers, uh, you can't go uh, a week without seeing something being hacked. and. Uh, so we have to write, we have to resurrect compilers and go back and recompile like the hypervisor from 2016 and get rid of things that are a problem. And so the compiler winds up being a tool internally to do a lot of magic for uh, security that I can't talk about. But a lot of that winds up feeding what we may be doing in product. The biggest problem with security today is that, like, I, I, and I don't understand it, is that um, people are not willing to pay performance costs for any kind of runtime security. They just won't do it. And it's, uh, uh, I think where we are uh, in the industry, we're a great lab for understanding how uh, attacks you can actually be. So that's all I can tell you. So just in case, um, you know, I obviously know what it is, but in case there's anyone in the room who doesn't know what the CFG flag does, could you perhaps explain it? <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. So one of the things that's out there right now is uh, we went to great lengths to make sure that if you compiled everything with slash guard CF, every indirect function uh, call will be checked against uh, something that works with the linker and the operating system to check that every indirect function call is going to a legal entry point. So if you got, if, if, uh, if there was heat corruption and you called through, which is typical in a use after free, if you, you know, used a dead object and somebody had done a heap spray, you're going to do an indirect call to something that's not a real entry in the program. So uh, these runtime checks for, uh, are, you know, are inserted not only for your for your classes or for your good old-fashioned C indirect function calls. They're also in there for all the funks that we, we do for like uh, casting and uh, some other crazy C++ language features. So when you compile that way, we can assure you that every single indirect function call, whether you wrote it or it was inserted by the compiler, is going to be checked. Well, um, this is a great one for software engineering. Uh, if you have a real, if you have two DLLs with indirect function calls going between them in a chatty interface, then every every one of these checks winds up being disastrously expensive. When we first brought this up for uh, IE, the Explorer, MSHTML and JScript 9 were two DLLs, and that was one of the first places we brought it up, and we saw that we took a 15% hit because the, it was the chattiest interface that I had ever ever seen. So we wound up having to refactor the code. Maybe a couple of words about SDL. 
Yeah, if you go on the MSDN on the website, you can see all of the, uh, the code generation that we do for SDL. And I just mentioned a few of them. Software de development lifecycle. I don't know what, I have no idea why they'd say that. <laughs> Thanks. Okay, optimization flex, finally. Uh, I'd like to ask, you know, the O2 is, it's, these are unicorns and uh, O3 is double rainbows and stuff. And uh, do you think that apart from this flag, is it uh, useful and is it worth it to explore more? I know about the architecture flag and uh, sometimes when you have numerical, uh, numerical computations, it's useful to go into that kind of, you know, family of flags, but is there something else that sh we should look onto? I mean, so we, most of our code, we develop O3, and then setting the architecture is the single most important thing you can do after that. That's absolutely a given. And then, depending on your amount of uh, mathematical stuff you're, you're doing and your, your ability to sustain a small amount of inaccuracy, depending on how you're written, obviously all the fast maths or the fun safe as they are, um, math optimization. Oh, go on, John. I could not disagree with the last comment more. <laughs> Um, well, you can you can talk about that in a second, but if you can if you if, if you can sustain that kind of thing, then great. Apparently, maybe you can't. So um, maybe I'll defer to Charlie right now and let him explain. You, you do financial stuff, right? I do. <laughs> <laughs> that explains a lot of things. Not, not, <laughs> none of the code none of the code in our environment that uh, deals with double precision maths as it goes anywhere near like the actual finance part of anything. Everything is fixed point for us. So, <laughs> for the record, <laughs> before I get fired. Um, <laughs> uh, uh, well, but, um, yeah, quite. Um, so, yeah, but I mean, some of those on optimizations obviously are very unsafe. Um, we tend to turn the NAND stuff back on again because that's useful for us. Um, but you know, you need to give it a go and see. But um, the only other thing I've ever put on uh, to sort of increase the performance over and above that is in GCC, where we've had to like bump up some of the inline like number of times and try number of depths of things. But we had hugely inline, uh, sorry, hugely templatized functions that called other functions, called other functions, called other functions, and. That was really the problem. The problem with the way we wrote the code, not the optimizer settings. I mean, obviously, compilers are a big bag of heuristics, and so sometimes they need a little nudge in the right direction, but for the most part, they do an amazing, amazing job. Yeah, um, yeah I'm realizing I'm sat right between these two here, and they're bigger, <laughs> bigger than I am. Um, but, um, but uh, yeah, in that particular example of like bumping up the inline thing, the, the compile time went up from like several seconds to minutes and minutes for one single file. So, you know, it's, it's only worth doing if you can prove that it's worthwhile. Um, so definitely take snippets of code and put them through popular online um, web compiler <laughs> exploration um, system and see if they make any difference. But always measure it as well. <laughs> and there will never be advertising on my website, just, uh, just in case. <laughs> talk about fast math stuff. So, so, the, so how many, does <laughs> folks even know what the fast math flags even do? Many. That's not enough hands. Okay. So, so floating point mathematics is very, very complicated. We could have a whole session talking about floating point mathematics. But the, the biggest thing to realize is that they do not form an algebra in a mathematical sense. You cannot do things with floating point math and preserve semantics that you would expect to do with essentially any other form of algebra. You cannot uh, reassociate things. You cannot uh, regroup things. Basic identities don't hold. Um, I believe the uh, the additive identity in floating point math is negative zero. Like this doesn't make like these these things are completely surprising and very non-intuitive. And what fast math does is it essentially tells the compiler to ignore all of those rules. All of them. And, and what this means is that you get what's called unbounded precision loss. The optimizations enabled by fast math can cause a difference in precision of a computation without any bound. Right? You can go from 
Yeah, no, really. The, the, the GCC inclined fast math flags, there are other flags. But the GCC inclined fast math flags can cause precision loss without bound. You can take a computation yeah. which, according to IEEE floating point semantics, is required to produce negative infinity. And you can turn on fast math and it will produce positive infinity. Okay? <laughs> right? like, and when you think about that, you'll realize why I get a little scared when people talk about turning these things on. Now, there actually are a bunch of floating point um, optimizations that are, I think are actually very reasonable to turn on. These are things like saying you don't have NANDs, uh, it's saying that you don't have sine zero, or you don't care about sine zero, you don't care about denormals. There are a couple of others that I can't remember offhand. These flags are actually much safer. They don't introduce what's called unbounded precision loss. They actually introduce very bounded precision loss in numerical context. <coughs> and so, so there are some flags that are actually quite reasonable to turn on. I, I really dislike fast math because with, like, there's, al there's almost nothing you can really do to even test for correctness with fast math. Right? Like, if you have a single test case that can have its result changed due to floating point precision differences, right, then you, you will never be able to detect a compiler bug with that test case, ever. Because any precision change is like, well, that's within the bounds of fast math. Like, it, it could have done that, right? Which is kind of a, not a great situation to be in, right? Every bug becomes your bug, and I don't think you want to be there. Um, the other thing I want to say is there are two other big compiler options for performance that you should be looking at, and I think they're way bigger than fast math. They might be bigger than 03 versus 02. They might not be bigger than setting the, the correct CPU architecture. And that is profile guided optimization and link time optimization. Uh, so profile guided optimization, uh, that there, there's lots of information on, on the web about it. It's fairly complex. You need to do something to collect a profile and then you can use that to optimize. But all three compilers that, that most people are talking about, right? actually every compiler I know of, from IBM's XLC to ICC to GCC to Clang, LBM to Microsoft's compiler, all of them supports many different forms of profile-guided optimization. Um, link time optimization is the other big one. Uh, and this one's a little bit harder to find. Uh, Microsoft's compiler has had uh, what's called link time code generation. Is that still the right term? LTCG for, for a long time. It's really, it's really robust. Lots of folks actually use that one. Um, and uh, just recently, uh, LLVM has grown kind of a, a fairly robust link time optimization framework called ThinLTO that uh, a colleague of mine, Teresa Johnson, I don't know if she's still here, but she, she gave a talk about um, here, here at CPPCon, so you can check out the video about that. But those are, those are some other build time things. Can I just uh, refer to that uh, link time optimization? Uh, for quite a long time, we used uh, like the poor man's link time optimization, which just consists of you know getting into one file, and uh, for a very long time it worked quite well. And uh, we just recently compared to the I think it was the Clang's link time optimization, and it was comparable, but but still it was it was a bit faster. Do you think it was uh, try the LTL? LTL. Right. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. And, and make sure you use the linker plugin as well, because I sometimes I, I mean I, this is a GCC specific thing. If you don't if you don't use that, then the, the visibility information that's really really critical, which is missing in the single file catting thing, is lost. And so there's still some of the symbols are thought to be external, and that allows all sorts of internal optimizations. And I should pass it. The thing I was confused about though is your your situation was like a lot of linear algebra, right? So the vectorizer makes a big difference for you, right? So. So the, the, the one thing that we have on our, our compiler is what we call FP fast, and then you can select ABX2. And that would seem to be something that was super targeted to the problem you were describing. Did you ever look at that? Because if you don't say FP fast, you're actually not using 50% of the vector unit. Uh, well, I've never used uh, Visual Studio and uh, oh. Windows compiler, so, and Windows. <laughs> I'm in the wrong room. I'm in the total wrong room. Good answer. I appreciate it. I appreciate it. Hi. Uh, I sometimes do benchmarks uh, in my spare time. Uh, recently, I did a very stupid benchmark. I just created a long vector uh, a list and I uh, accumulated both of them and I compiled it with Clang in O1. And the list was faster. Is it expected? 
So, so you could you clarify the question? You say you compile a vector versus a list, and the list yes. is faster. Exactly. In O1. It accumulates faster. Yes. Oh, accumulates faster. Yeah. yeah, yeah, okay. Does anyone know anything about Clang optimization? <laughs> uh, so, so, so I'm going to let you in on, on another secret. I'm letting in everybody on the, the good secrets I know. Um, uh, O1 in Clang is kind of useless right now. Um, Actually, yeah, it's faster with uh, O0. <laughs> yeah, so, so I, I can tell you what O1 is doing, but you're not going to be happy. So, so O1 keeps, like, tries to optimize all the code. Uh, Almost like normal, it turns off like a few of the really slow optimization passes, but it also turns off inlining, <laughs> which means that like it, it, it sometimes it works. So so the only inlining you get at a one is the inlining that you've like that users have forced in their source code, and so so you can get really bizarre artifacts, which you shouldn't do. Yes, you shouldn't do. Yeah. Um, <laughs> th thank you. Uh, um, you shouldn't do that, but like, some people do. And so you can get bizarre swings in performance with a one because, like, if one file happens to use, you know, forced inlining a little bit more than another piece of the code, like then at a one, like, wow, does that matter? And at a two, it won't matter at all. And so I can't, I can't really suggest lots of benchmarking with a one. Uh, the, the kind of developer, the developer game developers would like to see. Well, okay, I don't want to speak for all of them. There are a lot. I would kind of like to see LLVM's O1 flag turn into a kind of minimal fast pile of optimizations for kind of you know day-to-day -day development right where, where you don't want to wait for a, a completely unoptimized build but you like but you also don't want to run every optimization under the hood um, otherwise known as exactly what Microsoft's compiler does by default which again I'm a little jealous about but right now it's not that and it's a long way from it I just change my default A little bit of a meta question for you. Uh, I'm asked this one of my coworkers a lot. Um, any idea when we're going to get all the way from the top to the bottom, you know, linker to IDE, a 64-bit Visual Studio? Uh. <laughs> 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 one guy. So we're, we're in discussions about that right now. One of the things that's driving that is the uh, the Xbox gaming industry. So the the thing that we're finding out is that when you go to 64-bit pointers, of course, everything slows down. It's, a, it's not intuitive. So all the pointers are 64 bits, so you reduce the cache utilization by 50%. So we're uh, investigating it and trying to do things out of proc to actually get uh, additional memory that way. But it's, a, it's, a, it's not a, a simple switch, and uh, it's really related to the, the memory performance. Can, can I troll you a little bit? <laughs> so there's this other linker for Windows. <laughs> LLVM has this uh, has this native Windows toolchain, and it includes a linker LLV, um, which is a native Windows linker, and it's 64-bit most often, <coughs> and and it's also a lot faster. So hang on. <laughs> The main thing, the thing I was talking to you about was the IDE. That's sorry. That was the big. That was a really. That's a really big deal for us. And uh, but what he's saying about the linker is true. And one of the things that um, I think lights up the difference though between the linkers is that uh, just on 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 the Windows platform, in order to support the debug experience, which we have seriously prioritized uh, over the years. Is that we'll actually create things like we'll um, serialize a hash table. So you you know when you bring up the quick watch window and you just type the name of a variable and boom, it's like you can get the uh, the value right away. The linker actually creates that hash table at link time and lays it down with all the debug information. So those are the types of things that um, I don't think all other linkers are doing. <laughs> and we just taught LLD to write PDB files <laughs> with the hash tables. <laughs> I didn't want to put I'm losing. additional comment. But, uh, I'm stuck in the middle. <laughs> I don't want to put additional comment, but for your amusement, you know, you say you bring up the debugger and the things appear immediately. For us, usually on the first breakpoint, that's at least 30 seconds. Are you using FastLink or are you using 
Uh, yeah, we use Fastlink. If we don't, the linker crashes when we emit debug information. Yeah, the, the, so um, one of the new things, that, is this with uh, 2015 or 2017? Both. Okay, so what happens with Fastlink is uh, in order to get the iteration time uh, down, we created a small PDB, which was like a dictionary that pointed back into the OBJ files. And then there's a system called DIA, which will then, the first time you load this stuff up, it will actually create the hash table for you. So the first time, you take a hit, but then the rest of the time, you should be in the same inner loop that you'd be normally used to. And that was to really speed up the build system, or the, um, <coughs> the link step in the inner loop. Okay? <laughs> I think we're good. <laughs> to uh, expand on something you alluded to in an answer a moment ago, uh, and to give me a better mental model of how the unicorns interpret the signs that are seen in the rainbows, what is the current uh, best practices in terms of inlining, specifically um, if there's any difference between a method that's marked inline versus a method that is included inline in the class definition? Are those different meanings? at this point in time. Can I, can I leave now? Yeah. <laughs> uh, so, so this is... Well, well, for which compiler are you getting out of this? Yeah. Um, <laughs> primarily GCC and Clang. <laughs> we'll accept an answer for Windows also. <laughs> so, so, so... Yeah. That's how the Windows guy. Yeah, I <laughs> <laughs> All right. So the, most of the most of the inline hints in the language are sort of uh, ignored by the compiler, unless you're unless you're compiling OB1, and we'll actually honor anything that's marked inline in the source code. And then we also have do uh, when you're doing the profile guided optimization, that's really what you want to do to get really really accurate uh, inlining, because that's when we'll differentiate between compiling for speed or size. And that's a really, really big deal that you can't do on your own unless you've actually really finely tuned things. And then the other thing that we do is that uh, we get super aggressive when we, without Pogo, because ironically, we find out that it reduces code size. One of the things that we just did was we went super aggressive and um, started inlining these um, functions that would return a user-defined data type which had a destructor that would throw. You wouldn't think that was a big deal, but it hit 40,000 times when we compiled Windows, and it's, it reduced the total text section uh, by about, um, I think it was 973,000 kilobytes. So uh, you'd be surprised that inlining is amazingly important for driving optimization to get code size down. So that's why we don't honor the, the, the keywords in the language. Okay, so this is actually uh, something I've, I, I spent a bunch of time dealing with uh, myself and some of my colleagues at Google. Um, uh, and so as it happens, I can answer this for both LLVM and GCC. I know much more about GCC here than I usually do because we, we actually look really closely at what GCC does and what LLVM does um, uh, at Google while we we're kind of comparing performance. So, so the first thing to realize is, is that, you know, uh, for folks who don't realize this, uh, in the inline keyword isn't just about inlining, um, it's actually a linkage specifier, like it changes <coughs> the linkage of your function. You, you should not just put inline on functions to, to try and get them to get inlined. That's a bad idea. Um, but it does actually also influence uh, both GCC and LLVM's inlining decisions. Um, so for both compilers, inline uh, functions with the inline keyword on them get a slightly higher inlining uh, threshold, and so they're slightly more likely to be inlined. Um, GCC also gives that higher threshold to functions without the inline keyword, but that are just placed inline in the class body. LLVM only gives it when you actually have the inline keyword. Um, so that, that's, what, that's what actually happens. But, but as some commentary on that, um, A, I think all of that is terrible. And we should do exactly what Jim said and completely ignore this keyword in terms of the cost functions. And I'll tell you why. Because whether you put the keyword there, some, like, sometimes it's optional. Inside of a class body, it's optional, right? But like, there are plenty of places where you, 
you either must put the inline keyword, even if it's a really bad inline candidate, right? Or where you must not put the inline keyword because you actually need it to have a particular linkage, right? I actually have seen a bunch of people who went and put class out of line class method de definitions. They put the inline keyword on them in their source file to try and get them to be inlined. And then they had these mysterious build breakages. Like, like they just they couldn't figure it out. You turn off the optimizer, and all of a sudden their binary would stop linking because of missing symbols. They could, just couldn't figure it out. And that's because we've coupled this optimization hint to a semantic keyword. We should not be doing that as a basic principle of language design, right? So I would prefer that the, the compiler stop paying attention to this. Unfortunately, if you change the compiler, if you change LVM to stop paying attention to the inline keyword, you aggress really important benchmarks by a very terrifying amount. And though it's worth enough money that we can't just, you know, freely go and do this. But I would like to find a way out of this conundrum, and I don't really encourage people to take advantage of this fact. It's mostly a, a legacy thing. Um, and the way to actually control inlining effectively, right, the right way to do this is through profile, profile guidance. That really is, that, like, if you have challenging inlining problems, there are essentially two things you want to do. One, you want to factor your code so that you have function calls in, in better places. You actually, like, think about kind of partitioning your functionality into meaningful decompositions between function boundaries, right? The, the compiler can, can very easily get rid of a call, but it's really hard for it to introduce a call. We actually are looking at how to do this, but it's incredibly hard. You're going to have a much better job of that than the compiler is. And so try and introduce good boundaries between different parts of your function. The biggest one here is if you have a fast path and a slow path in your code, put them in separate functions, like seriously. Like, have a, have a call to the slow path, right? Make it easy on the compiler, right? And then reach to the profile when you need, when you need additional help. And you can either do profile-guided optimization, which is the best approach, if you can. Or you can use kind of in-source code profile hints, right? You can have this condition that says, I, I don't expect to have to go to the slow path, right? I expect to finish this and return with the fast path. And, and the inliners and in compilers really love those hints. They do a fantastic job of actually controlling inlining that way. It, just on a sort of practical note as well, um, if you didn't realize, you can actually define a lambda and invoke it immediately in line. And you can also put attributes on that lambda to say it's cold and no inlinable. And so you can conveniently put like error handling code if you need it to be just in, in the function itself. Although that's not necessarily a best practice, as I'm sure. <laughs> no, no. I, I'm, I'm just here with bad news. Okay. Most, well, okay, I don't know most. I know LLVM does it. I think GCC does too. Uh, uh, LLVM, if there's only one call site to a function, it's always in line. Yeah, that's... Because, like, there's no savings to leaving it out of line. And so we just did line. Yeah. It doesn't, like, if we have profile information, right? and there's only one call site, we'll take the code region that it gets inlined into, and we'll shuffle it as far away as we know how to. And so we're going to try and save all of your eye cache that we can, no matter what. The, the, the call doesn't help us much there. And so, so, so for a single call site, this is less important. Sorry. Yeah. That makes sense. All right. That actually speeds up the GCC benchmark. <laughs> yep. That's a big deal for that. Are you done? Yes. Okay. <laughs> Let's uh, make sure that these are the last two. Wait, That's last it. Two. Oh. Well, you want to go all night? No, no, no. I thought we were like, don't, don't we have like a speed round or something? <laughs> 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 Live words. Words. Yeah. words? Haiku answers only. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, yeah, yeah, no, it's fine. It's fine. Uh, okay. So, let's start it now. Here you go. Okay. Five words. Five words from me or five words from you? Building on the question of inline, you are rather adamant about never using always inline, and can you just like drive that point home somehow <laughs> in five words? Let's go, Dad Talk. You are probably wrong. Good. Are you guys done? Okay. Um, I think that's, I suppose, a
practical question. I haven't really got a lot of experience with um, profile unit optimization, but it sounds like a cool thing. Now, what I'm wondering is, how do I integrate that with my CI build system? So I'm, I'm running a profile guided optimization on my computer, but how do I get that to the CI system? Is that supported <coughs> on Windows, at least, for me? I can talk about something else, but... Uh, <laughs> run sensible tests. Oh, you can have more than five words. <laughs> them to drive your PGO. <laughs> On your continuous integration machine. Yeah, this is dreadful. Someone else, save me. You will need lots of infrastructure. Infrastructure. <laughs> uh, I would actually say what he said. It's infrastructure. Lots of Because yeah, what happens is when you when you build a, a model, am I seeing things? Totally, totally. All right. So when you profile, the first time you run, you, you, the code generator will instrument the file, and then you'll run it, and the instrumented code will actually create a table, right? And that table. <laughs> Please continue. All right. So then the table actually is then used in the second pass to optimize the code, make the inline decisions, figure out the fast paths, figure out which functions are compiled for speed or size. And so that means you've got an extra step and data in the build system, which is to Chandler's point, you need infrastructure to handle that. But how do I get that information in the first place? Because I have to run it on a relevant load for me, right? That's, that's my Oh, problem. that's the training data. So yeah. what you want to do is you run the instrumented uh, code on what you think are the data sets that are important, and you can accumulate and create uh, an averaging. But I can just move that to the CI system. You can run it on the CI build and instrument it there, or you can take it from production using Perf with some of the magical tools that Perf now provides to allow you to like feed it back. I mean, that's a little specific thing I just realized, but um, um, it, it's possible to. Of course, it's, it's a bit difficult for us because we we do measurement software, so we actually have to have a setup with with all the measurement stuff there, and that is not on the CI system for us. You have a you have a tough problem. Okay. <laughs> uh, this is more of a comment than a question, since this is the first time in my life I've ever seen a Microsoft compiler guy at a conference. Um, I wanted to say that uh, the Microsoft compiler has gotten a lot of shit over the years for like uh, not responding to bug reports, but lately it's been a night and day change. And uh, so people who have like been burned in the past by like waiting 10 years for a bug report to actually be processed, they work much faster now. Thanks. We actually use <laughs> That's a real credit to the team. The team has a really uh, has a high bar now and pride in actually responding. And the other thing that's kind of scary and uh, uh, don't share, but the uh, the reporting mechanisms were uh, also screwed up internally. <laughs> Sorry. I just want to ask about auto vectorization. Uh, we, we use auto vectorization just as we have manual vectorization where we vectorize many parts of our code, but sometimes we just like, we have lib tiff or whatever, we just want to auto vectorize that. And we use the Intel compiler, which will auto vectorize for many different architectures at once and put it all in one solid binary. The Visual Studio compiler does this as well. But Clang only vectorizes for one specific uh, SMIT architecture. Is there any plans to change that in the future where you can say, I want to vectorize for six, seven, eight different programs? Yes, patches are welcome. <laughs> Please. Excuse. 
But the, uh, <laughs> we know that one of the things that we're weak in probably is being able to do um, optimizations in little areas where um, there's a lot of modern C++ and that we are trying to actually make a big dent in that. So I don't know exactly what the pattern is that you're talking about, or the you know the is there a, a broad range of things that you you see? Well, it's it's really a lot of cases that are like this. Like you get two lines from GCC and Clang, and you get twenty lines from MSVC. You get five or ten lines from GCC and Clang, and you get hundred and fifty lines of assembly. So, so, so one thing about the way the compiler is more um, or God knows as everyone calls it, um, works, is that it's not very good at filtering the output from MSVC, so you sometimes it, you might be seeing some <coughs> stuff that is er erroneously not being taken away. So for example, if it's been in line at the call site of the actual place where you're using it, it might have been more aggressively in line than, than, or optimized than in the sort of out of line copy. So be aware of that. Also the compilers on um, Compiler were a little bit older and I'm working with the guys at Microsoft to get some newer ones up there. So. Hopefully it'll be improved from that point of view. <coughs> Micro benchmarks are lies. <laughs> <laughs> I have a short question for Gabo. Do you spend all day reading our terrible code? <laughs> uh, no. Ah. <laughs> Life's too short. <laughs> On a serious note, I don't store any of the code. It doesn't live anywhere on my servers. I, I should get a privacy policy out there and make sure that that's actually enshrined and said, like, like I have no interest in anything that you put on that site. And if you if you care about sending code across the internet to someone, someone else's server to run it, it's pretty trivial to run locally, and I suggest you do that if you if you want to. Hey. That was one of five. <laughs> uh, anybody else? Well, thank you very much for coming. Um, we do plan to do this next year. I mean, the same panelists. Um, but uh, this was actually uh, an extension of Chandler's talk to us in June and he was willing to come back and for more torture and uh, <laughs> and, <laughs> and so um, so see you next year and hopefully see you tomorrow at C++ and Internet of Things. Thanks.